Well, what a joy it is to be with you men and to sing with you, to worship the Lord with you, and to talk about the things of the Lord. It's my greatest joy, and I know it's your greatest joy, and when we all come together like this, it's just a compounded exponential blessing that, uh, that occurs. So I thank the Lord for this conference, and I thank God for our host uh, for this conference, who is my all-time favorite preacher, John MacArthur. So, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. And I've been given the wonderful assignment to speak to you today on Christ, the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 1. For time's sake, I want to begin reading in the middle of verse 20. He, God the Father, raised Him, God the Son, from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And He, God the Father, put all things in subjection under His feet, God the Son, and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. During the Reformation of the 16th century, there was a crisis of authority. And the crisis of authority not only dealt with who speaks for God, Scripture or Scripture and tradition, but it was also the crisis of authority that involved who is the head of the church. The church in Rome announced that there was but one head of the church on earth, that being the Pope. The very authority of heaven, they claimed, was invested in this one man, the vicar of Rome. And they claimed that he as head of the church on earth spoke infallibly and decided impeccably. But the Reformers pushed back, and the Reformers called Him Antichrist. They claim there is but one head of the church on earth, and it is the one who is the head of all things in heaven, none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. The same crisis of authority was breaking out in England at the very same time as well when Henry VIII declared his break from the church of Rome and proclaimed himself to be head of the church of England. And the English reformers taught or fought back and defied the monarch of England by saying, no, we have but one head of the church on earth, and it is the head who is in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for this, these brave reformers were burned at the stake. A century later, King Charles I demanded that the Church of England recognize him as the head of their church. And the Scots retorted famously, we have no head but Christ. And in 1638, they signed the National Covenant, saying that Christ alone is the head of the church. And for this, their blood flowed through the streets like a flood. This matter of the headship 
of the church is not an incidental matter. It is a fundamental matter. It is not peripheral. It is primary. It is not secondary. It is supreme. No pope is the head of the church. No hierarchy of cardinals and bishops is the head of the church. No pastor is the head of the church. You are not the head of the church. I am not the head of the church. No elder board is head of the church. No congregational vote is the head of the church. No seminary president is the head of the church. No denominational president is the head of the church. There is but one head of the church, and He is the one who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, who with the shedding of His own blood has purchased the church for Himself. And so in this session, I want us to think carefully about Christ the head of the church. And I have three headings that I want to set before you. I want to talk to you about the meaning of Christ's headship. And then second, I want us to consider the ministries of Christ's headship. And then finally, the mandate of Christ's headship. So let's begin with the meaning of Christ's headship. And in this Ephesians 1 passage, there are two key components, two key concepts that are involved in understanding what it means for Jesus Christ to be the head of the church. And the first component is this, that Jesus is our ruling head. He is our ruling head. He is Lord over the church. And so when it says that He is head, it means that He is sovereign. It means that He has supreme authority over all matters that transpire in the church. It means that He is the ruler of the church. He, he is of superior authority and rank. No one else has the supreme authority but Him. Uh, we use this word even in our normal English language today when we say that someone is head of state, or we say that someone is the head of his corporation. Uh, that means he is the governing head over the country or over the corporation, and that is exactly what Paul is saying here, beginning in the middle of verse 20. Look at it again with me very carefully. He, God the Father, raised Him, God the Son, from the dead because He is a living head. He is not a dead head. He is a living head. He has been raised from the dead and seated Him at His right hand. As you know, the right hand of God the Father is that place of highest authority in, in heaven and earth, and the Father has enthroned His Son and has invested with Him all authority. So he says in verse 21, just how great is this authority far above all rule and authority, power, and dominion. Those two words, far above, means exceedingly above, uh, far and above, way beyond any other authority, name, rule, or dominion, far beyond any ordinary degree. It is supreme to the, to the exponential degree. The Father has seated the Son in this place by which He is far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. That is a reference to designations within, within the hierarchy of angels. And then when He adds, and every name that is named. That includes every king, every prince, every judge, every pharaoh, every czar, every president, every prime minister, anybody and everybody, whatever your name is, He is far above every name that is named. And the idea is not only in heaven with the angelic beings, but here upon the earth with all earthly powers. And then Paul expands this even more and says, not only in this age, referring to within time and all of the dimensions of, of time, of, of human history, but also in the one to come, 
referring to eternity future, which is to say by this enthronement at the right hand of God the Father, there are no term limits upon the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will never be brought down off the throne. He will never be impeached. He will never step aside. He will reign forever and ever, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And then in verse 22, and He, God the Father, put all things… Now, all things refers to all things visible and invisible, all things human and angelic, all things in heaven and on earth and in hell, all peoples, all events, all destinies, all things. There is nothing outside of all things. It is a comprehensive, universal extension of term. He put all things in subjection. And this word subjection is a Greek word, hupotasso, that is a military term, and it refers to subordinates lining up under a superior, lining up under a superior officer. And God the Father has lined up everything that there is in the universe in submission and in subordination under the supreme sovereignty of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that is good, everything that is bad, everything that is holy, everything that is evil, everything is under the supreme authority. And He put all of this under His feet which was a designation in ancient times of a defeated king would be brought into the throne room of the victorious king, and the defeated king that was subdued and defeated would be forced to lay before the throne of the victorious king, and the victorious king would rest his feet on top of the subjected king as an expression of sovereignty and authority. And drawing from this, Paul is saying that the entire world, the entire universe, all of the galaxies, anything and everything that takes place and transpires in heaven, on earth, and in hell, time, eternity, north, south, east, west, is all under the dominion of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And His sovereignty is so far surpassing that none of us can even comprehend just how sovereign the Lord Jesus Christ is. And when He comes back in Revelation chapter 19, He will have many diadems upon His head. And they will just be stacked up, one on top of another, on top of another, uh, as an expression of the, the hyper-sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ and He has a name that no one knows, meaning the dimensions of His sovereignty are incomprehensible to the finite human mind. We cannot even imagine how in control the Lord Jesus Christ is of everything and everybody for time and eternity. Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian, said, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign, does not cry out, mine. And R.C. Sproul says, there is not one maverick molecule in the entire universe. It all exists to do His bidding. And it is this sovereign Christ, the fulfillment of Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. There is no authority outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has all authority. And whatever authority a a leader or a politician would have or a husband or or a mother is simply a delegated authority that has come down from the one who possesses all authority. And now, at the end of verse 22, Paul continues to expand this and said, and gave Him, this supreme sovereign Lord, this 
indisputable king of kings gave him as head over all things to the church. Now, this word head, kaphale, means ruling authority. It means supreme to the extreme. It means sovereign ruler, the one possessing all governing power. In other words, Jesus' will is supreme in all matters. His word is final. His doctrine is binding. His decrees are determinative. His decisions are absolute. And it is He as head who is ruling and governing over the church. It is not the toes or the elbows who are ruling. It is the head who is ruling. Jesus is the head and we are the body. Jesus is Lord and we are the slaves. Jesus is king and we are the subjects. Jesus is master and we are His servants. Jesus is the teacher and we are His disciples. Jesus is the commander and we are His soldiers. Jesus is the way and we are His followers. Jesus is the builder and we are His stones. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest and we are His day laborers. Jesus is everything. Ruling head. The second aspect is He is the organic head. As we continue to look in verse 23, this head, who is the ruling head, is also the source of all life for the church. He, he infuses life into the church. He infuses grace into the church. He gives His wisdom and His power and, and His love and peace to the church. Everything that the church needs comes from the organic head, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I do not have a need, but that Jesus is all sufficient to meet the need in the church. And so we continue to read the fullness of Him. That, that, that refers to the full sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that He is and everything that is at His disposal, of Him who fills all. And the all there refers to all members of the body, all true believers. He pours Himself into us, and He fills us, and He lives within us, and He is our ample supply and lives within us as we live for Him. And then he says at the end of verse 23, in all. The fullness of Him who fills all in all. And when he says in all, he is referring to in all places and in all times, wherever the church is, in whatever the generation, whatever the continent, Whatever the denomination, whatever the association, whatever the location, He fills all in all. All of Himself in all of the church, in all places, and in all times. That is an extraordinary statement. And so the meaning of Christ's headship is that He is over us as ruling head and He is in us as organic head. He is over us as Lord. He is in us as our life. He is over us as our sovereign. He is in us as our source and supply for all that we need. So, we must be always looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We must be always setting our mind on things above and not on things of the earth. We need to be always looking up to the Lord Jesus Christ and relying upon Him and looking to Him and leaning upon Him and abiding in Him and drawing from Him everything that we need because He is the head of the church. Now, second, the ministries of Christ's headship. If you would, turn with me to the book of Acts. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 1, 
in verse 1. And I want to raise this question, how does this sovereign head of the church exercise His supreme authority over the church, and how does this sovereign head meet the needs of His church? And so, to answer that question, I want us to spend some time looking into the book of Acts and see how Christ as our ruling head and organic head builds His church. And so it begins in chapter 1, verse 1, the first account I composed referring to the gospel of Luke, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And when He says, began to do and teach, clearly implies that there is a continuing work that Jesus would undergo throughout the church age and in the church. And so, as Jesus will continue to be the head of the church, I just want to walk through some pages here in the book of Acts and set before us how Christ, the head of the church, is building His church. The first thing I want you to know is head, He has authority to choose His leaders. In Acts chapter 1 and in verse 24, after they have gathered together in the upper room, the 120 disciples, and it comes time to replace Judas, they look to the head of the church to supply the replacement for Judas. As spiritual leadership is needed, they look to the head of the church. And in verse 24, we read, and they prayed and said, you, Lord… Now, Lord here refers not to God the Father, but to God the Son. Lord is the same as in verse 21, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this Lord who in verse 22 was baptized by John, this same Lord Jesus who was, who was resurrected from the dead, verse 22, this same Lord Jesus who has ascended from their very midst into heaven, it is this Lord Jesus that in verse 24, they pray to Him, and we pray to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, but they're looking to the head of the church. Now, you, Lord, know the hearts of all men, and no one knows the hearts of men like the Lord Jesus Christ, who has x-ray vision and sees into the depths of every situation. You know the hearts of all men. Show which one of these two you have chosen. And they, in verse 23, they've just put forward uh, Joseph and Matthias. And so, verse 26, they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who answered this prayer as the head of the church. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who sovereignly controls even the casting of the lot into the lap. Proverbs 16, 33 says, the casting of the lot into the lap, it's every turning up is from the Lord. And the head of the church sovereignly controlled the casting of the lot in order to replace Judas with the man of Jesus' choosing. In fact, you will note, please, in verse, at the end of verse 24, they do not ask Jesus to confirm their choice. They humble themselves and they say, show us which one you have chosen. And Jesus continues to choose His leaders. And Jesus continues to appoint His leaders in the church. And this was true not only of the twelve, but of, uh, of pastors and elders and spiritual leadership to this day. Now, there are many local churches who do not want to pursue what is found in Scripture that we had preached to us by Mark Dever earlier. They want to go their own way. They want to appoint their own man by his position in the community or his popularity. But those churches that will humble themselves before the Lord and ask for God's man to be brought to them, the head of the church will providentially move heaven and earth if necessary to bring God's man to that church. And if you are a pastor, and if you are under the understanding that it is God Himself who has called you and Christ who has appointed you, that is a very humbling thing. 
that you're God's man, that you're a man of God. But that is the first ministry we see of the head of the church. And then second, as head, he has authority to call a people to himself. If we come to chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, I want you to note that it is Jesus who fulfills what He said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build My church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We see Him immediately here on the day of Pentecost already beginning to build His church by His sovereign grace. And in verse 39 we read, for the promise is for you and your children, referring to the Jews who are there and, and, and those offsprings of Jews, and for all who are far off, those who are far off are Gentiles. But the word all needs some qualification because not everyone is built into the church, and not everyone is, is brought to faith in Christ. And so at the end of verse 39, he makes the qualification, here it is, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. No more, no less. No more will be called, no less will be called, but as many as will be called, the Lord will bring them to Himself. Now, the Lord, we go back to verse 21, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we ask, what is the name of the Lord? What is His name? In verse 22, we see the name of the Lord, Jesus the Nazarene, and Lord is mentioned again in verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God, referring to God the Father, has made Him Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. There is no doubt who the Lord is, it is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. And it is this Lord in verse 39 who is calling out a people unto Himself. And it is an effectual call. It is an irresistible call. It is a call that overcomes man's resistance. It is a call that makes us willing in the day of His power. It is a call with which we are given ears to hear and a heart to respond. The Bible talks of two different kinds of calls. There is the external call, which is the call of the preacher, the call of the teacher, the call of the parent. But it can only go to the ear, and it can go no deeper. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. many are called, few are chosen. There must be the internal call of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself by His Spirit in which this call actually summons and subpoenas the one that is called. When He calls, that one comes. And in John 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall anyone pluck them from My hand. Now, Luke goes on to describe this further at the end of verse 47 when he says, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. The word saved there is very important. The Lord is not just adding church members. The Lord is not adding merely those who profess Christ. He is, he is adding, in verse 47, those who are being converted and called and regenerated by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. You see, Jesus as the ruling head is sovereign over who He calls into the church. No one comes into the true church except Jesus calls them, and all whom He calls will come. And it is for these that He died, it is for these that He laid down His life. And what we see here is that Jesus guarantees the success of gospel preaching. When we give the effectual call, Jesus will give, or excuse me, when we give the external call, Jesus will give the internal call to those who have been chosen by the Father in eternity past and entrusted to Him to be His chosen bride. 
And that is why in Matthew eleven twenty seven 27, Jesus said, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Now, the only way that you and I know the Father is because Jesus sovereignly willed that we would know the Father. And the only way that we are in the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ is because Jesus Himself, as the head of the church, powerfully and effectually summoned us to come into the church. He will build the church, and nothing can resist and nothing can hinder its progress and its advancement. Come, if you will, to chapter 3 in verse 16, and third, I want you to see as head He has authority to give saving faith. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 16, we see that all whom He calls believe, and the reason they believe is because Jesus gives them saving faith to believe. And in Acts 3 and verse 16, Peter, as he is preaching, says, and on the basis of faith. Now, what I want you to notice in this verse is faith is mentioned twice. The first time, faith is in Jesus. The second time, faith is through Jesus or from Jesus. So, notice 3.16, and on the basis of faith in His name, that is true saving faith, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through Him has given Him this perfect health in the presence of you all." What this text is saying that as Jesus builds His church, those whom He calls out of the world, He gives them saving faith so that they can exercise faith in Him. In other words, Jesus is both the source and the object of saving faith. Faith that is in Jesus is faith that comes through Jesus, is a faith that has come from Jesus. That's what Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Where where did you get saving faith? Oh, not from yourself. A dead man don't believe. We were spiritually dead in trespasses and sin. We had to be given the gift of faith in order to believe in Jesus, and the gift to believe in Jesus is the gift that came from Jesus. Amen. Philippians 1, 29 says, it's been granted unto you not only to believe in His name, but to suffer for His name. So faith must be given to us. George Whitfield put it this way, man has free will to go to hell but no free will to go to heaven. (laughs) And Spurgeon said, I have heard much about free will, but I have never yet seen it. So as head of the church, he calls the people to himself. As head of the church, he gives saving faith. Fourth, as head of the church, he has authority to grant repentance. So come to chapter 5 in verse 31, and what I'm wanting to trace for you is how Jesus builds His church. He is building His church one soul at a time. I want to start reading in verse 30, but what I want you to see is in verse 31, but in verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you had put to death by hanging Him on a cross. Now, verse 31, He, there's no doubt what the antecedent is for He. The antecedent of He in verse 31 is Jesus in verse 30. He is the one whom God exalted to His right hand as a prince and a Savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, this is crystal clear. A blind man could see this. Jesus, the exalted, ascended Lord, gives two gifts that man has nothing to do to conjure it up. One is forgiveness of sin. We're all in agreement with that. In my hands, no price I bring, simply to His cross I cling. 
But the other gift is equally monergistic as well. There is only one active agent that grants repentance, and it is the one who gives the free gift of forgiveness of sin. You can't have it both ways. It's, it's a package deal. These are grace gifts that Jesus gives to His church to build His church. And He says the exact same in Acts 11 and verse 18. It says that God granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to faith. You see, no one can repent until God gives them the gift of repentance. We are morally plagued by an inability to do what is required of us. When Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that is a binding command upon everyone who heard those words, but the, the crisis was no one can repent in and of themselves. Repentance has to be granted and given to them. And so as we preach the Word, as we proclaim the gospel, God has gone before us, and God comes in with us, and He calls out His chosen bride. He gives them saving faith. He grants them repentance. This is what Jesus does to build His church. Now, fifth, as head, He has authority to convert His enemies. Come to chapter 9, if you would, beginning in verse 1. And we see that he has many enemies, many persecutors of the church, but no one is beyond the sovereign authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus can overcome any and all resistance to him or to his gospel. So in Acts 9, in verse 1, you know what this account is. It's the conversion of, of Saul of Tarsus. He is the chief of sinners. In an argument from the greater to the lesser, if God can do this to Saul of Tarsus, if Jesus can do this, He can do this with anybody. And so in, in, in verse 1, now Saul, still breathing threats and murders, no one could have been more anti-Christ, anti-church than Saul of Tarsus breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him, verse 2, to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He, he is hunting down the Christians like, like they are an animal, like they are a prey, and, and he is an aggressive hunter. And he is going after them with the full force of all of his energies and all of his passions and all of his personality. And verse 3, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly, and this can happen just in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, a light from heaven flashed around him, and it was none other than the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ verse 4, and he fell to the ground. Jesus knocked him off his high horse and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, to persecute the church that he is building is to persecute the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he feels what we feel, and when you come against the church, you come against the head of the church. And so, verse 5, he said, who are you, Lord? He answered his own question before the end of the sentence. <laughs> you talk about lordship salvation. I mean, he's in the kingdom before you can put the question mark. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up, verse 6, and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. We see that Jesus can bring His enemies down to their knees. He can humble them in a moment. 
He can bring them to the place of self-denial where they look up and confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ and submit their lives and surrender their lives under His mighty authority. And this is but a prototype of every conversion. It's just different place, different circumstance, different, different time. But it's what Jesus did in your life if you are actually converted. He humbled you and brought you low. No one giggles through the narrow gate. No one skips into the kingdom. Everyone has been brought down humble. And look at verse 15. The Lord said to him, to to Ananias, the hen of the church is now going to explain to Ananias his purposes and his plans for Saul of Tarsus. So he says, go, for he, referring to Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name. There is no way under heaven that Saul of Tarsus could have resisted the mighty call of the Lord Jesus Christ to come to him, and there is no way he could have put up any opposition to the powerful voice of Jesus when Jesus called him to faith in Himself. There is no one beyond the saving power of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when He calls, we come. Come, if you will, to chapter chapter 16. What I want you to see, six, is he, as head, he has authority to open closed hearts. And in Acts chapter 16, I want you to note, beginning in verse 13, that there is no heart so closed, but that Jesus is able to throw it wide open. You see, this is how He builds the church. And so, on Paul's second missionary journey, he comes to the city of Philippi, and in verse 13, on the Sabbath day, he went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken to Paul. Now, if the Lord opened her heart, that obviously presupposes that her heart was closed. In fact, it was sealed shut. It, it, it It was locked down. There was no way anyone could pry open her heart. It would need more than just the Lord knocking on the door of her heart. It couldn't be opened. It was sealed shut by sin and unbelief. But as Paul preached and gave the external call, the Lord Jesus, the head of the church, gave the internal call, and He threw open the door of her heart, and she responded to the things that were being spoken by Paul. Now, I want you to see how strong this word opened is. Do you see it in verse 14? The Lord opened her heart. I want you to look ahead to verse 26 because the very same word, opened, will be used later in this chapter after Paul has created a a crisis in Philippi with his preaching that he and Silas were thrown into prison. You, You know this account. And in verse 26 we read, as they are in prison, and every prison door is, is locked tight, and they are chained to, to the jailers, verse 26, and suddenly there came a great earthquake. It was a mega earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. The, the whole prison house was just moved in its place. The earthquake was so powerful, and um, immediately… That's just like the suddenly in Acts 9. And immediately, 
all the doors were, here's our word, opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. God sent an earthquake so powerful that all of the prison doors were opened that night. Not just where Paul was, they were all opened. It was, it was a, an earth-shaking event. But it pales into insignificance compared to the earthquake that took place spiritually in the heart of Lydia when God blasted the doors off of her heart and God came charging in like a conquering king to claim her as His own. You see, this is how Jesus builds His church. This is how Jesus who is the head of the church, who is the ruling head and organic head, how He blows open hardened hearts that they would respond to the gospel, and He makes them willing in the day of His power. And that is exactly what happened in your life, my friend, and that is exactly what happened in my life. It was King Jesus who sent the spiritual earthquake and opened the door of your heart. He didn't just stand there knocking. He blew it off the hinges and just came walking in and said, mine. Come to chapter 18. Seventh is head. He has authority to guarantee gospel success. And as he's building his church, he has his people who will believe and who will respond when the word of God goes forth. And in chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, Paul comes to, to Corinth and, and he becomes a Uh, one who goes into the synagogue on Sabbath. He reasons. He tries to persuade Jews and and Greeks. Verse 6, but they resisted, they blasphemed, and he shook out his garments, which symbolized his break from them, and said, your blood be on your own heads. That's a benediction. (laughs) And says, from now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And in verses 7 and 8, While he's still there in town, before he can leave town, he's preaching, and people just are being saved. They begin to believe. Those who believe are being baptized. And Paul doesn't know what to do. And so in verse 9, and the Lord. Who is this? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Send to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And some of them were already saved, but a lot of them were not yet saved. And it's just a matter of Jesus calling them out as the gospel goes forward, blowing the doors off of their closed heart, granting them saving faith, granting them repentance and infusing them with with spiritual life, eternal life, abundant life. This is what you do when you're the head of the church. You take over. There's one more I want you to see. Come to chapter 20. In verse 28, and I've skipped over several that I wanted to give you, but these are the I think we're getting the idea. It's not that Jesus might build the church, hopes to build the church, could build the church, would build the church, should build the church. Let me tell you, He is building the church. And nothing in heaven, on earth, or in hell will stop it. And so in chapter 20 and verse 28, the last thing that I want you to see is head. He has authority to purchase and possess the church. And Jesus is Lord over the church by right of purchase possession. 
And so in Acts 20, verse 28, you recall as Paul has been with the elders at Ephesus and he gives his, his farewell speech and he says in verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. The Lord Jesus is the one who at the cross, with the shedding of His blood, making a blood atonement for our sins, He purchased the church with His own blood. He purchased the church of God with His own blood. And the church that He has bought now belongs to Him by right of ownership. The true church belongs to Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to anyone else. It doesn't belong to the leadership in the local church. It doesn't belong to the denominational hierarchy. It doesn't belong to, to a seminary. It doesn't belong to a congregation. It belongs to the one who shed His blood upon the cross, laying down His life, a ransom for many. And Jesus said in John 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. This is why Jesus is so triumphant in building His church. It's because He has already purchased the church 2,000 years ago with His own blood. And He did not die for those who will die in unbelief. That would have meant Jesus died in vain. But He died for His sheep. And all for whom He died, He calls. And all for whom He died, He died for and calls. He gives them saving faith. He gives them repentance. He opens their heart. He knocks them off their high horse. He brings them to Himself because He is the sovereign head of the church. In Ephesians 5.25, it says, Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. In Ephesians 5, verse 1, it says, Be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Jesus also loved you and gave Himself up for us. Well, the last thing I would say, and I'll just say it off the top of my head, is the mandate of Christ's headship. None of us are free to reinvent church. None of us are free to come up with our own way of doing church. None of us are free to come up with our own way to preach, our own way to worship. The head of the church has already instructed us how He desires to be worshiped and how He desires for His Word to be preached and how His body is to function. The body does not decide this. The head of the church decides this. And so we find in Scripture what many refer to as the regulative principle, that the activities and ministries and worship of the church will be regulated by whatever Jesus says. And He has every right to govern every square inch of our church because He is the head of the church. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to have such a glorious head as we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nobody ever had a greater head than do we. And we praise You that in His sovereignty, He is all-wise, He is all-loving, He is full of grace and mercy for us, and I pray that we will be faithful to our ruling organic head.
to follow Him, to obey Him, to serve Him, to love Him, to adore Him, and to submit to Him with glad pleasure. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.